Okay, welcome everybody. Take two. <laughs> we are thrilled to be bringing on Monica Bivas, who is an extraordinary woman who has been through really just a tremendous amount in her life in regard to her own fertility journey. And um, she birth, she's had a miscarriage, but she's had tremendous struggle even trying to get pregnant before then. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. oh and she's here. <laughs> okay, wonderful. We, just to let everyone know, we had a little bit of technological difficulty. Welcome to 2021. I thought we had this all figured out, but we did not. <laughs> um, and so, Monica, I, you and I connected a long time ago, mm -hmm. and I'm just thrilled to be able to really bring you here so you can tell your story to our community. We, you know, one of the things that you know that we like to do is tell lots of different people's stories because the more we talk about it, and I know you do this in your own community also, the more we talk about it, mm -hmm. the less, the less shameful and the easier it is for other people to open up about their stories. So please introduce yourself to everyone. Tell people who you are. Oh, thank you so much, Aime. Thank you so much. So for the ones that don't know me, my name is Monica Vivas. Um, I um, I call myself an uh, IVF uh, veteran <laughs> because, you know, like uh, I'm kind of, I am done actually with all my, my journey, but it was very hard. And it was my own, uh, you know, experience with infertility, what took me to where I am now, um, helping other women, other couples, and uh, kind of uh, offering that support and advocacy because I know how lonely it can be uh, to walk this journey. Uh, I am originally from Colombia, uh, but my husband is from Israel. We both live here in the States, as well as you in New York, but in the suburbs. And um, we were fortunate, you know, God gave us two beautiful IVF girls. One is uh, 15 years old, my other one is eight years old. But in between all this journey, you know, I will say I suffer from, of a, you know, primary infertility and secondary infertility. So it was really a journey. And in between Elia, which is my older, and Maya, which is the younger, it was really um, a very challenging time. Um, so I'm here for any one of you that want to ask questions. You know, I'm an open book in all what my story has to do and all what we went through with my husband. Um, okay, so let's like, let's start a little bit from the beginning so people can really understand. So how did, tell, tell us how you met your husband and like how that, and then like, you know, in terms of your journey, of like when you decided you wanted to start trying, like talk to us a little bit, like take us back to the beginning. Okay, so it's, um, okay, so I was in Colombia, not, uh, I didn't have any, Intent. I was 29. I, you know, six months previous, um, before I met my husband, I, I broke up with my ex-boyfriend. I was three years in a relationship um, with um, a guy from Venezuela. It didn't work out. So I was kind of taking time to myself. I was 29. Uh, I never paid attention, honestly. I met to to the age, but you know, Latin American countries, we have these kind of taboos and cultural beliefs that put you like in a box. So I remember my aunts telling me, oh my God, you're 29, you know, like you need to find a husband. I'm like, why, why are you kidding me? I'm still living life. I don't want that, you know? <laughs> and the last thing I could think was getting married or having children, because I used to think the world is so crazy, why to bring a child to this crazy world? And look, I am now with two children and the world is crazier than before. So, That's 100% true. <laughs> it is true. And then you, I, I, sometimes I'm like, why I did this? I, You know, it's like my, my life is going upside down or backwards, but I guess I always kind of rely that there is a reason for that. And we just don't know and we will know along the way. So I had a friend in that time and she told me, listen, why you don't open a, like an account in match.com? You know, it was, and I'm like, no, I'm, you know, I'm kind of enjoying life, but you know, I did it. And it was funny. There was a 14 day trial that time. I didn't have to pay a penny. And the second day I, uh, I was already with the account open. My husband 
sent me a message uh, through, you know, it was in the time that it was through the phone, through the telephone line. It was not right. like now that it's wireless. Um, right. He sent me a message like, uh, oh, you know, I want you. And I'm like, what? So I went, you know, I checked the profile. Yeah, like directly. He like, you know, Israeli, you know, how Israelis are. They are like, yeah, I want this. Um, I want I, I want to have it. So yes, they're very blunt. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. That. So when I check on his profile and I saw his picture, I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's a good looking guy. But I'm not going to, you know, like, so I told him, what is what you want? I need you to read my profile because I'm looking for something serious. So he was serious. He said, I want you serious. Give me your phone number and I call you. And I'm like, but I'm in Colombia. It's going to cost you a fortune. And he said, I don't care. I give it to him. And, you know, he's calling me. But I, I, I was still connected because I was talking with, with another guy from Florida. Because, you know, it's for meeting people. Right. So and then he hung up. He connected again. And he said, you know, I'm calling you. Can you, you know, disconnect the line? And right. He called me, I disconnected, and from that first time, we, I, I never came back to, to match, and we talk every day for eight, ten hours. Wow. So, it was, that was September 2002, he came to meet me personally in November of 2002, came back to the States, and then we got married in Colombia in February, and I came here. He has a daughter from a previous marriage. So when I met Daniela, Daniela was one year and a half, and she was the one that kind of woke up that that motherly feeling, because it was very hard for me to have her just like like alone, you know. She was she was not mine. Right. So and I said I want to try for having my own children. He was in tune with me, and I say next month I'm gonna get pregnant. Why? Because I come from a very big family from my mom's side. There were 18 kids, nine boys, yeah. nine girls. Wow. All of them got pregnant. I have like around 243 cousins. They will get pregnant with the blow of a kiss. So I'm like, wow. I have motherhood really here. Right. So we start to try about six months after our wedding. We want to have a little bit of fun together. And then nothing happened. Three months, you know, the next month, I, nothing happened. And then, you know, I start to think. And he was like, listen, sometimes it takes time, you know. He explained me, but then six months pass, I start to think something is wrong with me because he has a daughter. So we went to the gynecologist. He's telling me, you know, usually a couple can have a hard time. One year could be a stress, anxiety. Let's try, I put you on Clomid. So he put me the following six months on Clomid, nothing happened. So then I became really crazy because I have the tendency of put so much thoughts in my head and drive myself crazy from that. Right. So we... You know, he was very patient with me. He said, uh, we're going to do all the tests or so hormones, blood. Everything was perfect. And then he said, yes, could be something physical. So we did an hysterosalpingogram. And that's when we found out that due to an endometriosis, my both tubes were blocked. We tried to do two times laparoscopies to try to open. It didn't work. So my only choice, my only chance was IVF. So when I entered into that, it was 2004. There was no social media like now, I mean, nothing, nothing, you know, so, and I felt, like you said in the beginning, I felt ashamed, I felt like my body was failing me, I felt that, you know, like I came defective to this world, like you feel that it's a punishment, all the worst things that can cross your mind, they were there, but my husband was very, you know, like very firm and he said listen we need to see the positive side of this there is a possibility and i'm like yes but it's only 25 percent and he's telling me but what do you think is normally naturally is the same is the same to catch the right is right same. so you know i think he used to tell me i think it's even easier with this you know like to put me to cheer me up so we did our first ibf it was started in 2004 in 2004 uh, and i got pregnant luckily the first time Mm, our RE was in shock. He, he, he was telling me, he said, you know, sometimes bad things are blessings because your, your eggs are very good quality. The embryos that came out were very good quality. And I think that, you know, if you will not have what you have, probably you will be pregnant every nine months. And I cannot take birth control because it gives me a cyst on my breast. So I cannot oh, do that. Okay. So, okay. you know, I start to kind of see things, but still I was new into that. 
the the thing is that they never told us that we could froze embryos or I could froze my eggs. So we just were happy and you know, like we we are we got pregnant. Let's see that it's gonna work. And they didn't tell us that. So we said when when Elia born, okay, we're gonna do uh, another IVF in two or three years. We you know we take care of ourselves. You know, right. we are always very balanced. And it's gonna be as easy as the first time. But it didn't happen, you know. Two years and a half later, when we went back to the doctor, to the same doctor, because I have to say I love Dr. Brandis. I don't know if he's still open or not. But we went there. He, in that time, changed his team. So we started our second IVF. But in the clinic, they did a mistake with the chart, my chart and another patient chart. And they switched the medicine, you know, the amount of medicine. So yeah. they gave me the wrong one. And uh, I got the uh, OHSS, so my ovaries oh, became gosh. ballooning. So he has to cancel. He was super disappointed. I was upset, but my husband was even more. He basically called and screamed at him uh, with all the reason. However, because we were lucky and, and, and he was very organized with our first, he was very responsible. He said, listen, I know it's our fault. Let's wait for Monica to clean her body, you know, three months. We need right. to, because I had already a bunch of hormones. And I'm going to take care of the third cycle. We don't charge anything. We give you all the medicine up to the point that it was now. And we go from there. So we did that. I got pregnant. Uh, in that time, that third cycle, we, we wanted to have a boy. We have already a, a Elias. So we did the PGS testing that, again, it was uh, 2000. 2009, it was not as advanced as it is now. However, you know, we came, uh, I got eight embryos, three were, you know, with three were with chromosomic issues. From these uh, five that got okay, there were three boys, good, good quality, and two girls. One girl, he said, he recommended not to put it because also he found out that there was some chromosomic issues. So I said, okay, so now we know about the frozen, let's froze the the female and let's transfer the three males. So my husband says, no, we transferred the four. That time's also different. Today, you know that you tra can transfer only one maximum. Correct. Two. Oh no, we, with my first one also, we transfer four with Elia and he catch. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. And you know what? I, actually, I was like praying. I was like, oh, give me two in one shot so I don't need to. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> so I got pregnant, we transferred the three males, the, the girl that was even behind, he, the doctor says, I don't think she's gonna catch, she's gonna catch a baby boy. Well, she catch, the, the three babies, the three males, she kicked the butt of the males, <laughs> she catch. I was 37, the pregnancy was going good, you know, I did the amniocentesis because of the age, everything right. was perfect, we confirmed it was a girl, she was healthy, but I didn't know I was developing a blood clot issue. So at 39 weeks, she died, and I had to go and deliver her due to blood, blood clots in the umbilical cord. So that yeah. was that was devastating. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes I don't you know. There is days that, you know, you get sensitive. So it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was something that I never, I never thought it could happen to me. And when it happens, something like this to you, you think you are the only one in the world that is happening. Right. Um, so as you know, we are Jewish too. So we call our rabbi, my husband right away called our rabbi and our rabbi suggests not to do any, any autopsy. It's, you know, you know, the 30, 30 days rule, it belongs to God. We yep. follow all of that. So as you know, also, I don't know where is my daughter uh, buried. That is, and, and you know what? I am, I am relief. I am thankful for that. Because if I would have known, probably I would not be in, in, in this kind of peace of mind that I have now. Uh, so definitely, I realized, of course, after so many years that this happened for a reason. Not in the moment, of course. I was totally devastated. I, I really thought even about taking my life because it's a pain. It's a pain that you don't want to wish to no one. Has no name. Correct. Correct. Has no name. Oh. Ma Monica, did you, did you, like, did you know, like, did you feel that your pregnancy, like, was she, like, did she stop kicking? Did she, yes, like, I did, did you know? Yes, I knew it. I have it. You know, she stopped. Actually, I, I even remember the date, like, yesterday. 
she was still buried on October 5th, 2010. That was a Tuesday, fifth, uh, four Monday, uh, three, so on the 2nd of October, which it was a Saturday, we went with my husband to do the pictures. And she was not moving. And I told him that morning, you know, the baby is not moving. I didn't know it was a girl. Meaning he wanted the belly pictures, you're saying. Like. Yes, exactly. And we went. And then he told, I told him, you know, the baby is not moving. I didn't know it was a girl because I didn't know. I didn't want to know. He knew. Right. He knew that it was a right. girl because he wanted. And, and I told him, you can know. I don't want to know. Right. So, and then I told him the baby is not moving. And he said, listen. And I start to freak out. So he told me, you know, don't worry, because it happens to us with Aaliyah. And of course, the first one, we went to the hospital, she was sleeping, but she was right. okay. So right. he kind of calmed me down. But you know, like you said, I met deep down, I wasn't secure. And I told my mom, because one of my aunts had the same years ago, the same exact. I told my mom, I told her, mom, I'm afraid that, that, that this is going to happen. She was like, don't think about it. Don't throw this in the universe. Right. And the following Tuesday, I, wa I went with her to the doctor, to the gynecologist for um, the ladies measuring me in the head and everything. Oh, it looks, I say, can I see the heartbeat? So when she started to look, she didn't find it. And I became, they had to hold me in the bed. They had to call my mom. They had to. And my husband came and we were in such a shock that we couldn't drive, you know? So we have to leave our two, my car and his car there. And the doctor has to drive us in his car and cancel anything that he had for taking me. Although he told me in the, in the you know, in the office, he told me, you know, I, I think that you should come tomorrow. And I am telling him how you can tell me that, how you can tell me to go and sleep knowing that my baby is dead. There is no way we go now. We take that baby now. Right. Right. So we did you know, Rabbi did his work. They went, he went with, you know, the baby Dean to pick up the baby the next day. And as soon as everything was done, he came, but I was devastated. And this, you know, the way that we heal as women and the way that men grieves is it's different. So, so I thought that my husband was not feeling anything because his way of, of moving out from that pain was going right away to work and not even say anything. Yes, hug me and telling me we're going to have another baby, but you know, that's it. And I'm crying, crying, crying. And you know, that start to cause a strain in our relationship. So I drilled his brain and two months later, I didn't even wait the three months that you're supposed to wait, you know, to clean. Two yeah. months later, we went to the doctor and told him that we want another IVF. He said, I'm not doing that to you. You are emotionally, physically, and mentally a mess. You need to heal. And I got upset in him. He gave me another reference, Dr. Mukherjee from RMA. I went to him. He also tried to convince me not to do it, to wait. But I couldn't. I needed to feel that, that, that emptiness. You know, it's, it's yeah. a very selfish uh, human action. But, but we do it unconsciously, you know, it's not consciously. It's just, we want to just calm that pain. Right, right. And, and for some people, like, it's, it's so interesting, right? I mean, I'm sure you see this in your work also. Some people want to fill it immediately, yes. immediately. I, they, they don't want to wait and they need to fill it immediately. And for other people, they, they just, they can't even think about wanting to fill it because it's too hard to even think about going back there emotionally. Absolutely. And so it's like, it's like there are two totally separate, like th there's almost no one in the middle. It's like you're either here no. or, or either there. there. And that's, totally. Yeah. You are yeah. totally right. And for me it was very, and don't get me wrong, the fact of wanting that also I have that fear that you just said that it's gonna, but it was my only way to heal in that. Right. Uh, it was a very rational, like very rushable thought. It was not not coming from a place of awareness. You know what I mean? Of course, of course. So we did that IVF. I got pregnant, but it happens what it's supposed to happen. What the doctor says, I miscarriage at seven and a half weeks. <laughs> and my husband and I were very much apart because of what happened. So there was no support on, on any side. So I miscarriage. So 
imagine the double pain so it was terrible it was it was like i put myself in such a hell from the rushable thing that i wanted to do we almost got divorced this brought a bunch of things you know so i was devastated i was very selfish i didn't th think about elia elia was five right i didn't think about my husband about my mom about all the people that was around me you know supporting me because they were supporting me and uh, to tell Elia, she was five she was already a little girl with you know with a, some kind of awareness so right my husband was the one that told her exactly what happened because that was the way that why we need to hide you know right and um, we almost got divorced we were into lawyers and everything and you know how is our community, our rabbi came and said, listen, you guys love each other. If it is a yes, you need to fight for it. If it is a no, then there's nothing to do. We are crazy about each other with my husband. There is no denial on that. With all the ups and downs and roller coasters. So, and uh, we came to the agreement that what you just said, we need to heal the loss of Isabel. We need to heal the loss of the little other one. We didn't right. know what it was. And we need to work first on ourselves because we cannot bring a child into a messy, you know, relationship. It's a balagan. It's a mess. Yep. So we worked for a year on that. We got close to Elia, you know, Daniela, my stepdaughter. We work on what we have without, you know, of course, I have my, my meltdowns. You know, I have moments that attack me and I need to cry and cry and cry. That's the way for me to get over or clean you know let go the bad feelings yes and after that year we said we're gonna do a last IVF, and no matter what it is the result if it is not we stop we stay with alia and daniela and if it is amazing because i still felt that need of feeling that emptiness yeah so we did a last IVF in what today is RMA of Long Island. In that time, it was Long Island IVF with Dr. Brenner, incredible doctor. We transferred at time three embryos. And Maya was born. At week 20, approximately, they put me on blood thinners, you know, Lovenox. Yep. And don't get me wrong. It's when I start to kind of be a little bit more calm and realize that, they, that I'm not the only one and there is so many women and couples going through this hell and nobody understands them. Sometimes they run away from, from everything that can remind them that they cannot have children naturally. Right. So I start to work on creating my own coaching based on my experience. Although I was crazy, I trust me, I mean, when, I, when my start to move, that was a nightmare. I I, this is exactly what I wanted to ask you. How did you get through the pregnancies? Oh. We all know the pregnancies after loss are hell. Like hell. they just are. They just yes. are. H how did you deal with that? So um, from the moment I started my last IBF, you know, um, the rabbi's wife gave me the book, you know, the Tfilas Hana, you know, that book yes. for the women. Yes, and I found so Tfilas Chana, meaning the, the prayers of Chana. Okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, so for pregnant woman, and I made the promise that, you know, no matter what situation I'm going to be, uh, this is going to be something that I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. And this gave me so much strength, you know, like the fact uh, that I, I, I believe that this was the time and, and, and God was giving me that gave me a lot of strength however once she started to move i learned precisely at what times she will move at what times i, I also didn't know what uh, what she was i didn't want to know actually i got confused with isabel i knew it was a girl because in the amnosynthesis it was i got confused with maya with maya i didn't want to know i just wanted to have a healthy baby right. but my husband knew he wanted to know so she started to move i knew at what times in the morning mid-morning uh, afternoon and night will move even when she was sleeping so when I was sleeping so when I was sleeping she used to move around 2 15 to 30 in the morning every night if this girl will not move at that time I will wake up like a crazy woman wake up my husband tell him to bring me juice or chocolate or something to wake up the poor girl so I never left her alone she was moving constantly so at week she born she was born at week 37 it was a schedule you know delivery because yep. of my issues Yep. And uh, there was a little uh, possibility that because at that week, babies have like a, um, like a mucus around their uh, lungs. So they 
can have issues breathing, right. that she might be a few weeks, another three or four weeks in the NICU. But it didn't. So as soon as she born, the first one that got her was my husband. And then when he put my on me, it was like I felt healed. Doesn't mean that I forgot. My Isabel is there, but I felt right. healed. I felt that God gave me back the same soul in a different body, but this time in the right time. So she is, you know, like, it was like I felt healed and, and she knows about Isabel. She knows right. she's now eight. She right. knows. Uh, I showed them the little box, which I opened them. I opened that box probably after seven, eight years. Um, and I don't open it anymore because I, like I tell you, feel belongs to God, not to me. Right. And that's it, you know, like uh, there was a moment that we say, you know, we are happy. It was a promise with it that it was the last IBF. And, you know, I do every night still the prayer for the benefit for the child. Wow. Every night. I promise I never. And if there is a time that for whatever reason I forget, I'll do it the next day as soon as I wake up in the morning. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and you know, don't get me wrong. There is times in this, especially now around all the situation that is going on with the world. Sometimes I feel kind of the same feeling I felt when I lost the baby, you know, upset on God. I remember as the rabbi, it's okay to feel upset on God because I, and he was like, absolutely. He's not going to let love you less or more. He understands you. There is a book that they gave me also. Why? bad things happen to yep. good people you know that book yep and and during these days there is times that i am upset for i ask him why, why you let this happen in all the world you know but somehow i keep my faith i guess that is what is gonna get us somewhere one day uh, i i mean there, there's so much there's so much i mean that we talk about here in this space about that like this being angry at god and you know is that is that problematic? Am I allowed to feel angry? Am I allowed to have any of these feelings? Does it mean he's going to punish me more if I'm angry? Is he like how, how did how did you how did you work through that? And and what did what did your rabbi have to say about that? So you know, the, like you said, so when I my husband, you know, as as any Israeli is more secular than close to being very religious. However, you know, during all the time after the loss, he he put feeling, you know, and when I asked the rabbi if it was okay to, to feel upset with God, that I was kind of losing my, my faith on, on the fact that if he really existed and that fear of asking that if he's going to be upset on me. So he told me something that I, my mom was telling me since she was, since I was little, that there is, there is no God, that, that, that conception of God being angry or that he's going to punish us or that he is going to, is really um, a very kind of not, non-existent conception. God is so good with us that he gave us our free will to choose what is good or not to do. So I, I remember asking him, so how come he's, how, how come I, I lost a baby? I am a good person. You know, it's like, right. he says sometimes lessons come through pain. And then along the way, you're going to see what is the reason. And and I saw it. I saw it. I, mean, I, I saw it because there was no good time for Isabel to come. We were, we were not in the best place with my husband, you know. There was a lot of pressure. And I, I always think maybe God wanted me to give a little bit more time to Elia. Maybe he wanted me to go through that because I am here now helping other women that that is feeling that and I can be that kind of support because I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you that a pain like that can cause, if there is two ways to go, either you come out of it to the light or right. either you just drag into it and, and because I'm not going to lie to you, I wanted to die. It's a very, very terrible pain. So what is the only way that you stop such a strong pain is not being here. Right. So, right. but somehow I got that strength. I honestly believe that uh, God is 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 something is is not a punishment uh, being or energy or higher power. I think that it's all come from us. We are part of His creation, and whatever the world is going or is gonna go, comes from our within our change. You know, if I I am learning, 
if I want the world to change, I need to start to change within me and things, you know. And, and um, that is a debate I have these days because the world is going so crazy. And imagine for people like, like you, like me, like other people that is going through the journey of infertility with all of these questions that come. So I, I always say, you know, whatever is your faith, relay in something that you believe and, and, you know, just ask for the best guidance is within you. What, what was the thing, like when you, when you were saying before, you know, you, you were in that deep, dark space, you were, you know, you, you, you felt suicidal at different points. Yes. Like you were, you were there. And I, yes. like I, and I very much relate to that. I was never suicidal, but I was very much down in that deep, dark place too, after mm -hmm. my losses. What, what what were the things that helped dig you out? Like, was it this conversation with the rabbi? Say, like, or, or like, was it so, like, what, what were the things that helped? That could be part of it, the conversations with him, you know, having my mom and my, my mom is with me since both of my kids were little, still it is having her. She's a very strong woman. But I'm going to tell you honestly, what saved me is, <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's, but it's the truth. I am, terribly scared from physical pain so <laughs> look at this so I, I uh, when when I felt that and you know I I tell you why I thought suicidal because I think that as further the loss goes the pain is worse the pain is worse so a loss is a loss but the more advanced, the more time goes, is worse because the memories. So imagine a parent, a, a, a couple of parents that right. lose a child at 18 year old or a 14 year old. And, uh, you know, it, it's, on, it's not only the loss, it's the way they lose it. So, you know, all together bring a lot of, of pain. So I will never, ever judge a person that have chosen to, do, to go that way because nobody knows the pain they are going through, only them. Right. Yes, it's a very selfish act, absolutely. But at the same time, is you you know we can't judge them. So the the physical pain was what. So I went to, I went on Google. You know how it is. Yeah. So and I will look uh, the best ways to die without physical pain. Oh gosh. You know? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna. Lie we're to laughing you. about it now. Yes. Yeah. Now I laugh. <laughs> so so and then everything that I could read was like somehow like a little pain and the only way that I could I could find it was not legal and then I will like I told you in the in the beginning my thoughts go to what if to the very very future and then I'm thinking okay so what if I try this and then it doesn't happen someone come and save me then I go to jail then I am in jail with a with a forced <laughs> chair and with the pain of that so believe it or not that was the thing that stopped me wow. And of wow. course, somehow the faith, the community, our synagogue, the people in every day was coming to bring us food. We have to tell the rabbi, please tell the people to don't bring us no more food because we don't know what to do with that. <laughs> and, and, and from them, the, the beauty of that, people come, you know, we cannot sit Shiva, but people will come still, you know. Right. The beauty of that, it was that everyone that will come will tell me, you know, I'm so sorry, a hug, love. But when we start to sit and talk, they will never try to focus on asking me about my pain. They will focus on try to distract my mind, tell me a story, something happy. And I love that. I love that because you know how is our mind. Our mind start to train. And there was moments, you know, like after two weeks of the loss that still people will come and someone will say something funny and I will laugh. And right away I'm like, why I'm laughing? I was right. like, I shouldn't be loved. I just lost a baby two weeks. Why am I that guilt? But I think the community support us. We didn't have to pay a penny, a penny, I mean, for, for the burial of my daughter. Zero. Wow. They didn't wow. let us. And this is something I love about our Jewish community. And, 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 and every community in the world should have that kind of support to anyone that is going through this kind of pain or losing anyone that they love, you know, right. your father, your mom, or, you know, your husband, your wife, which is a little bit easier to heal. That's why I tell you the pain of losing yep. a child has no name. You lose your wife, your husband, you are a widow, widower, you lose your parents, you are an orphan, but yep. 
this has no name. Yes. So I never went to therapy, but I, I definitely today in the position I am, I, I will strongly suggest to any woman that goes to a loss, especially if it is, you know, much more advanced, still birth, or, or even there is, you know, I have my friend Melo, I don't know if you know her, uh, after Chloe, yes, Melo yes. Garcia. Yes, she, yes. you know, her baby was born and I think Chloe was alive for a few days. She's a strong woman, incredible. She's specialized on grieving for that. So imagine that pain. So I always suggest if there is someone that has go through this or is going through that, please find someone that that is specialized in grieving you know, because it's very necessary and important to talk about it. When we talk about it, we are taking it out. We don't pile it up. Because yes. when, when, when we are like piling it up is when that kind of thoughts of, of not being, not wanting to be here can come. Yeah. It normalizes it. Speaking about it normalizes it because yes. otherwise you're in your own head and you're yes. in your own box and you think that what you're experiencing is just totally abnormal. And then when you actually start to talk about it and you have conversations, you realize, oh, I'm, yes, this still is horrible and terrible. And I'm still having all of these awful feelings, but these awful feelings are also happening to this person and this person and this person and this person because they also went through something terrible. There yes. is a commonality that immediately makes you feel better on some level. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and you know, um, remember we are, you know, I always said we are spiritual uh, souls living a human experience, so... So, you know, I always think that uh, uh, somehow, for example, a woman that goes through so many losses, like, you know, recurrent pregnancy loss, which is terrible. I always try to tell them, you know, it's, it's kind of the same soul is coming because we choose our parents. I truly believe that somehow we souls choose our parents. And and eventually that, that soul is going to catch, you know, like it's going to catch in that rainbow baby. It did to me, and I truly believe it was. I, I see Maya, and sometimes I talk with her. She tells me things, and I'm like, wow, it's definitely my, my Isabel in this different little body. She has her own personality, but the soul just right. wanted me to be her mommy, and she just came back, and she just said, you know what? I'm going to come back in the time that I want, not in the one that you want. You know what? You actually just, like, you just gave me chills because I... I like, I haven't ever heard that concept. I mean, I've heard the concept of, like, souls returning. And, you know, yes. obviously, we, we very much believe that in Judaism, that souls do return. Um, but I hadn't heard that specifically in regard to losses in that, like, and, and the reason why it just gave me chills is that, I mean, I had six miscarriages. Yes. I but know. my main losses were four second trimester losses. Mm -hmm. And in those losses there were two boys and two girls. My twins are one boy and one girl. You see, I'm telling you. It's and I'm like, I, I'm like, I can't even like, I'm like totally overwhelmed right now. I'm just, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that's no, no, I, I, it's, I, it's just, yeah. Yes. It is. It's a, and it's a very strong feeling and you can, you know, like it, it's spirituality is something that, actually the world needs now you know um i think that there is so much um my misguidance out there and i think that the ones that we can have a little bit of awareness we need to kind of inject love uh, you know to the world uh, awareness you know kindness and, absolutely absolutely and, you know, yes send a message that you know there is only one God, no matter what belief you are. You know, I'm, I'm Jewish, you are Jewish, but there's only one, no matter what it is. And nobody has the right to play him. And that's what is happening in the world now. And I think that he's giving us that lesson to open our eyes. So sometimes I have the doubt, uh, I may, you know, sometimes I ask myself, am I doing good? helping other couples and women to bring babies to the world that I told you, you know, is so upside down. And then my husband says, well, they are the ones that are somehow going to going to fix it if we teach them that love is about the other and that they need to see the, whatever is the mess and then based on that, follow 
this is not what it is and i want so so that is what is keeping me also help you know like running yes. into helping that yeah yes so so tell monica tell tell people what what you're doing now like how what what it how have you taken i mean you know he, your story is extraordinary in in okay. a thousand ways and when did you i mean you started speaking about it a little bit that you felt like you you wanted this you, you've been you had been through so much that you wanted wanted to be able to take some of that and give back yes. how how talk to us a little bit about that piece of it yes of course so because i was feeling so lonely one day i said you know i'm sure that there is so many women that was in around 2010 2011 actually 2011 when i got no 2012 when i got pregnant from maya so and i went to facebook you know and I started to look uh, about ibf pregnancy surrogacy you know and i create a group uh which is very active i have about 1800 members there and uh, I start to write a book too. Why a book? Because you know how IVF is so messy with the numbers. So I used to have papers all over and they got lost and with my numbers of the, you know, progesterone on this, what? So I said, you know, this needs somehow of organization. So I wrote a planner, it's called the IVF planner, in which I kind of tell my story, tell what IVF is, um, and it has all the charts necessary uh, for when you start an IVF uh, process, even IUI. Um, and then I start also to focus on helping women and couples in, in their emotional um, part. Why? Because, you know, we go to the clinic, our doctors are very busy, you know, they have a lot of patients, especially more now, when basically IVF is something that if you don't get pregnant the first time, oh, let's do IVF, even without, you know, like thinking. And it shouldn't be like that because also financially it's a very strong uh, uh, struggle that adds to the anxiety and all the emotional roller coaster that bring it. I always right. encourage people before you jump into IBF, let's see what is your diagnosis, let's see where you are at, how is your lifestyle, what are you doing, all of that. Um, so I am kind of, I will say I am that link between your clinic or even your gynecologist, because even if you are trying to conceive naturally and there is some stress, where I am that link between that physical and clinically part and the emotional and spiritual part that you have. So I offer mindset support, emotional support. Uh, you know, I encourage creativity, journaling, uh, finding someone you know, not necessarily me. There is so many in our community that are advocates uh, that can support you, that can understand you because they were there. Right. Uh, I, you know, like talk with an embryologist. I help them to find the right clinic, depending on where the location it is. Um, you know, find, you know, grants. Uh, you know, there is people that, you know, they want. I have now a girl in Miami, a beautiful girl from Cuba she wants to do because she is her only choice basically and i am helping her to find a clinic uh i recommend a, a, you know acupuncture or what is more the emotional and mindset it's what i am offering and i am very active in instagram as you know yep. and in my facebook group i send a newsletter every week with you know information i like to share stories too so I can show others that we are not the only ones because that's what we think, you know, oh, I'm the only one that is going through this and is hell. No, so every Tuesday and every Thursday, I publish a story. One is about IVF. The other one is just fertility rainbow stories. The one, for example, today is incredible. Two sisters, you can- Unbelievable. I mean, it's, just, just share with people about what it is, yeah. Yeah, so it's, and, and I always, I post the story, you know, in the feed, and if it is too long in the comments, but then you can go on my website, and it's in the blog, too. Uh, and I, why I share these stories, because as you say in the beginning, there is still a lot of couples, women, men, because let's face it, um, I'm going to be uh, clear, you know, like, there is same-sex couples that want to go to be parents, and it's even harder, because... Yes. Sometimes they need, for for example, for uh, 
same sex parents, men, men, they need surrogacy plus Correct. IVF and they can use their sperm. So it's a Correct. hell of a, you know, it's a Correct. plus financial. And then you have also women, women, they need their sperm done yep. or one is, is such a, um, uh, and a stressful thing. So all that support, I, I can be there. I understand. Uh, my book is a tool and uh, I am also launching soon the coloring book. Why? I told you I recommend creativity. It's a fertility coloring book that I um, create with um, Sheila um, Alexander. She, is a, she also is an IVF warrior and also she's an illustrator. So she, did, she helped me with all the illustrations. I am trying to finish. I, I like to do it with a small editorial to support small business. I got tired to support big, big corporations. <laughs> <laughs> it's done with me. I don't want yeah. that. But, you know, I'm looking into that. Hopefully in about two months, I, I want to, to have it. Amazing. So that's all my, you know, my focus and my coaching kind of uh, conception. So okay. anyone that wants to, to get in touch with me can follow me here in Instagram at Monica Vivas. Go and visit my website. And uh, I always answer personally my messages and my emails. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, Monica, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm so inspired by you. I was inspired by you when we met, you know, many moons ago. And I just, I, you, you have such, I mean, you have such a story, but you have such a light and such oh. a way of giving <coughs> to this community that is truly remarkable and inspiring and and really relatable I, you just you're able to give over like yes this is bad and yes i've been through it but yeah there's so much oh thank you so much <coughs> and now i'm choking one second yes don't worry <laughs> um i'm so grateful for you being here and Everyone, you will know how to find her. You see, I'm losing my voice now. Um, you will know how to find her on here on Instagram, and I'll make sure that we'll link out to your website also. And I just thank you so, so much for sharing of yourself with this community. We, we need, we all, you know, we need to hear the stories. We yes. need to hear them, and we need to know that we're not alone, and you are doing that every single day. Um, so thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Aime, because I feel the same like you. You are an incredible support, especially, you know, like there is some communities that we are so like close in the box still and we need to come out and talk. You know, we need to normalize that. You know, I always said infertility is not a sickness. It's really a condition. That's another Correct. thing we are fighting for. So please not only follow me, anyone that is there, I miss an incredible, incredible support too. And we are here not to compete, but to collaborate. And that's what Correct. we are doing now. Correct. That's exactly it. This is not about, I, I always say, this is not about you or you or you choose this one, choose that one. There is, there are so many of us that are out yes. there that our, our goal is only to work together to make sure that all of you get the help and support you need wherever you find it and that is the bottom line so exactly thank you so much for having me it has been an honor we were working on this for months and finally we made it <laughs> finally 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 okay everyone have a wonderful day monica thank you thank, thank you, you so much Aime. hugs and kisses to everyone bye, bye.